carotid stenosis that had recently caused a, caused a stroke. And these patients were randomized to carotid surgery versus not. Then we looked at asymptomatic carotid disease, randomizing patients with a stenosis that had not caused a stroke or recent stroke, randomizing these patients to surgery versus not. Then a new development, stenting, uh, became prominent and people repeated the symptomatic trials, but this time comparing surgery versus stenting, so due to two different types of intervention. Uh, and finally, uh, trials like ACST2, which we're going to talk about this uh, lunchtime, looked at asymptomatic lesions comparing surgery versus stenting. So there's a nice logical progression over the decades uh, looking at carotid uh, interventions. My slides have stopped working. Let's see. So uh, the high level executive summary for this uh, 20 minute talk is if you've got a symptomatic carotid artery disease, that is to say a narrowing that's caused a recent stroke, you should have an intervention if your narrowing is tight, greater than 50%. Surgery is probably better than stenting for the majority of patients. And we try to operate quickly. Uh, and you've probably seen the ACT FAST campaign on the TV, encouraging patients with strokes or stroke-like symptoms to seek urgent medical attention. In, in some ways, a stroke uh, is a bit like a heart attack, but a heart attack of the brain, uh, and it's an acute brain attack. And these patients need to present immediately to the emergency department for rapid scanning and rapid intervention. In contrast, for asymptomatic carotid artery disease, the jury was out until we did ACST2 as to whether surgery was better than stenting, or indeed any intervention was better than medical therapy alone. Uh, we intervene with people who have a, a, a tighter stenosis than symptomatic patients, typically greater than 70%. And the focus in asymptomatic carotid disease is to identify a small subgroup of high-risk patients who will benefit from expensive and sometimes hazardous intervention. So if you want to fall asleep now, that's it. You've probably got the key take home message from the slide. But for those who want a little bit more uh, in-depth knowledge, here goes. So there are three treatment choices for carotid artery stenosis. We can give medical therapy, we can do an operation, bottom left, or we can stent. A bit about surgery and the history of surgery. Uh, it was first done around 70 years ago. Uh, if you're in on this side of the Atlantic, you will believe it was first done by Eastcott and Rob, two surgeons from St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. If you live in North America, you will believe that Michael DeBakey, a surgeon from Texas, did it, did it first. DeBakey probably did do it first, but he was too busy operating on lots of patients to write it up. So the British surgeons did it and wrote it up. And those who write history um, tend to uh, win. And the operation as first done by either DeBakey or uh, Eastcott hasn't really changed very much in 70 years. We expose the artery through a, an incision at the front of the neck. Uh, we clamp it. We then open up the uh, diseased artery, scoop out the atheromatous plaque and uh, close the artery again. And that's it. Here are some operative uh, pictures. Top left is the uh, artery exposed. Uh, top right, the artery has been opened and the plaque is being removed. Bottom left is the atheromatous plaque as removed from the artery. Uh, they are quite horrible fatty things. Uh, and then bottom right is the artery patch repaired to prevent re-narrowing uh, when we close the artery up. These arteries are done, these operations are normally done under general anaesthetic, can be done under local anaesthetic, uh, take around two hours and the patient's normally in hospital for one to two days post-operatively. I did say that medical therapy is really important for stroke uh, prevention in the context of carotid artery disease. And we use triple medical therapy to prevent strokes and also heart attacks in these high vascular risk patients. This triple medical therapy includes things to thin the blood, antithrombotic therapy, typically aspirin, but sometimes other drugs as well. Blood pressure control is really important. And also important is lipid lowering therapy, uh, drugs like statins, which aggress which intensively lower LDL cholesterol. It's also really important to encourage patients to stop smoking if they are smoking and also to lose weight. Weight, And those are in italics not because they're unimportant, but just because they're different from the drug therapies that we do talk about. And a bit of evidence here about uh, statins. Statins were investigated in a large trial we coordinated in Oxford called the Heart Protection Study. And in this trial, being allocated to statins in this randomized trial halved your risks of symptomatic carotid artery disease which is really quite striking. But despite really good medical therapy, residual risk 
will remain. And despite good med medical therapy, patients with carotid artery disease go on to have strokes. So that's why we need to think about interventions as an adjunct to medical therapy, not instead of medical therapy. So what about medical therapy versus surgery for car carotid artery disease in asymptomatic patients? So we've looked at uh, pooled results of the three large trials that ask this question, the role of surgery in asymptomatic carotid disease versus medical therapy alone. So there were three trials, two were in North America, VA and ACAS, and one was European, our first ACST trial. These recruited patients over a 20 year time span and medical therapies changed. So this analysis, which I'm about to show you, allows us to look at the effect of really good medical therapies uh, on stroke risk in these trial participants. And here's the first result. This is a life table plot. Uh, the graph on the left includes the operative hazards associated with immediate surgery, shown in red lines, uh, uh, versus the, the risks of stroke associated, uh, seen in patients who did not have a carotid operation. Here you can see that the initially, in the bottom left graph, um, the lines um, diverge showing immediate risk associated with surgery. That's because a carotid operation carries with it a risk of stroke or death in the order of 3% in this trial. But after around two years, the lines cross and then begin to diverge quite sharply in favor of surgery. That is to say, the perioperative hazards begin to be outweighed by the long-term benefits uh, with a reduction in stroke risk seen in those who've had their arteries operated on. The graph on the right simply removes procedural risk um, because procedural risks probably don't generalize to future generations. Um, and this graph on the right shows the results of carotid um, on stroke following a successful carotid operation. And this slide shows that the risks of stroke are halved at five years and again at 10 years by allocation to an immediate carotid op uh, artery operation to remove potentially dangerous atherosclerotic material from the neck artery. So even in patients on good triple medical therapy, a successful operation will have the risk of stroke over the next five to 10 years. People are looking at this question again in the context of even better medical therapy. And these uh, three trials, one is completed, one is ongoing, and one is just starting in France. And the results will probably emerge over the next five years. So carotid artery surgery is one of the most commonly performed operations worldwide uh, on, on vascular disease. Hundreds of thousands of these operations are done each year, and also hundreds of thousands of stents. And what you get depends largely on the preference or prejudice of the treating clinician. If you see somebody who can only stent your artery, that's what you'll get. If you'll see someone who can only operate, you'll get an operation. Uh, there didn't really seem to be terribly strong evidence one way or another. To help clear up this uncertainty, we did a study. Um, well, before going on to that, this is a slide just showing carotid artery stenting in a little bit more detail. Uh, the artery is accessed by puncturing the groin in the same way that we angioplasty or balloon open arteries in the heart or elsewhere in the body. A stent is inserted across the narrowed vessel and to prevent atheromatous material being dislodged during the stent, we commonly deploy a, a filter upstream from the narrowed artery to capture atheromatous debris shown on the bottom right of, of this slide. So we set out to compare stenting versus surgery, uh, and some people questioned why we were asking this question, because smaller trials have been done in symptomatic patients, which showed stenting, shown in blue in this graph, was inferior to surgery. Uh, there was a sharp increase in periprocedural risks associated with stenting, typically caused by manipulation of catheters or wires across the narrowed artery in the neck. Um, but importantly, once you've had your procedure, both stenting and surgery appear to perform similarly well. And we thought it was important to ask the question because things had changed. Um, clearly, if you've got stable uh, plaques in your neck in an asymptomatic patient, the periprocedural risks are different and lower. Also, stent designs had changed, making the procedure more safe. And um, there were different ways of protecting the artery from atheromatous debris being dislodged during the procedure. Uh, the picture in the middle is one such device which minimizes the risks of debris. There are different ways of accessing the artery, a, a procedure called TCAR. And most importantly, people having had done these stents for 15 to 20 years had greater experience. So they were technically better at the procedure than they were um, back in the early trials. 
and also better at selecting patients who uh, could uh, have the procedure done safely. And all these secular advances may help reduce procedural crossed artery stenting risks. So we designed ACST2, a large, simple trial comparing surgery versus stenting in asymptomatic patients, and we've run about 3,600 patients. Um, the, the, the diagram shows how simple the trial design was. You needed to be eligible for the trial, a tight stenosis, no recent symptoms. Both stenting and surgery had to be feasible. Patients were randomized, typically over the phone, but in more recent years by uh, the internet, uh, and randomized to one of two treatments, surgery or stenting. Patients were followed up at 30 days in person but by their treating surgeon or stenter, and then annual follow-up uh, every year via postal questionnaire. This took around 13 years to do, and this is what I started, uh, this is what I looked like at the start of the trial. Uh, this is kind of what I look like now. We're going to carry on following up uh, ACST2 patients for a further five years, and I imagine this is what I look like uh, at the end of ACST2. We allowed patients uh, and surgeons to use whatever their usual techniques were. So for surgery, we weren't unduly prescriptive as to how the operation was done. We didn't mind about modes of anesthesia and various technical aspects of the operation. Similarly for stenting, any CE approved uh, stent was permitted to be used in the trial. And whilst we encouraged protection of the brain during the procedure, we didn't mandate it. And all this, these, this permissive design was uh, um, implemented to try to improve recruitment to, to the study. It was an international trial, but with a strong European uh, flavor. Uh, we had uh, sites in Western and Eastern Europe. We had some sites in Asia, and we had uh, a very productive site in uh, Canada and Calgary, and uh, two very good sites in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So of our 3,625 patients in ACST2, uh, over two thirds were men, which is quite common in vascular trials. One third had diabetes, which just shows the diabetic epidemic which is sweeping the Western world. Our mean age was 70, and the mean follow up I'm going to present today is five years. Medical therapies were good in ACST2, and we were interested in strokes, and we classified these by disability six months after they had occurred using a thing called the modified Rankin score, and disabling was considered a Rankin score of three or greater. So, some of you will have heard about real world evidence and real world data, um, which normally refers to registries which record procedural hazards. And these registries are really quite good at looking at procedural risks. And these registries, both stenting and surgery, each cause uh, stroke or death at a rate of around 1%. But what registries can't do is reliably compare long term non procedural stroke rates. That's because the reasons why some people have stents or surgery. Um, is because of comorbidities, and these things can materially influence long-term um, stroke and death rates. And so for that reason, you need a randomized study uh, to compare reliably long-term stroke and death rates for surgery versus stenting. And here's the first result of ACST2, and this is the key take-home message, I think. The large table plot on the left includes procedural risks, and that on the right excludes them. And you can see for both surgery and stenting, there was a 1% procedural risk of death or a disabling or fatal stroke. But following that, the long-term uh, stroke prevention uh, effects were similar for both stenting and surgery, with 2.5% risk of a disabling or fatal stroke following a successful stent or surgery seen at five years for both procedures. Looking at the results in a little bit more detail in this table, the graph on the, the line on the top in solid black is one you've seen already. Identical rates of disabling or fatal stroke in both the procedural and non-procedural periods. What's new in this table is shown in red, the non-disabling strokes, Rankin's 0, 1, and 2. And here you can see a numeric excess of these non-disabling strokes associated with those allocated to stenting when compared to surgery, both in the procedural period 48 versus 29, and in the non-procedural period, 47 versus 34. Looking into this excess of non-disabling strokes seen in stent patients in a little bit more detail, you can see that most of this, these non-disabling strokes are the more minor types of strokes, ranking naught and ranking one, both in the procedural period and the non-procedural period. And to make the point even more clearly, if we put 
all the strokes and all the deaths that occurred at any time by severity and look at stents versus surgery, you can see identical numbers of ranking greater than one strokes in both stent and surgery patients, but a, an excess of ranking naught and one stroke, non-disabling strokes that were either disappeared by six months or had left the patient still able to carry out all the usual pre previous activities associated with allocation to stenting. So putting it all together, in our 3,625 patients with a tight asymptomatic carotid stenosis, but with good compliance with allocated treatment and quite good medical therapy, we see a 1% 30-day risk in each group of a procedural death of disabling stroke, and thereafter over the next five years, a 2.5% risk in each group of non-procedural disabling or fatal stroke. But with stenting, there was a 1% to 2% excess risk of non-disabling strokes, that left patients still able to carry out all their previously usual activities. And pooled analyses of all the large randomized trials which compare stenting versus surgery show equivalent long-term protection against stroke. So to conclude, I now think we've got three good treatment choices for carotid stenosis. We can in selected patients just choose to manage them medically, but if the residual risk is high, we can now offer these patients either surgery or stenting, and the treatment choice can be based on particular patient characteristics, which might make you favour one treatment option over another. And we are now safe in the knowledge that both treatment choices offer similar long-term durable protection against stroke. Very happy to take some questions. And for those of you who'd like to know a little bit more about ACST2, it was published in the Lancet last year with open access, and the hyperlink to the, um, to the publication is shown here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. That was a really interesting presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat to this point, but I have got some questions here um, that would be interesting to talk about. Um, I wondered how long does it take in total for, for these kinds of trials to take place? Yeah, both ACST1 and ACST2 took 12 to 13 years to recruit. Um, so th th this is a, a marathon, not a sprint, Sarah. Um, and it's interesting to speculate as to why it takes so long and what we could do to speed things up, um, because yeah. it's obviously costly um, to do trials that take that long. And sometimes trial fatigue can set in, uh, both for the investigators, the collaborators, and, and indeed the funders too get a bit um, worried about trials that take so long to recruit. Um, and there are some regulatory and bureaucratic um, hurdles that... Um, I think we're designed with good intentions, but actually slow down um, trial setup and trial recruitment. And it would be nice for some of those to be um, uh, looked at critically. And indeed, the, the recent COVID pandemic didn't have a lot of good things, but one good thing was um, we, we learned how to do trials really, really quickly in COVID. And hopefully some of the lessons learned from trials like recovery will be implemented to streamline trial processes uh, nationally and internationally. Um, but, but to do a trial like ACST2, you're dependent on patients presenting to your collaborating institutions with a condition um, that needs a stent or surgery. And um, inevitably, you only recruit a, a fraction, a small fraction of patients who are actually undergoing this treatment worldwide. Um, we, we set out hoping to have 5,000 patients. That proved impossible. So we settled on 3,600 following um, discussions with the statisticians. But really, we'd like to have had 30,000 patients, but it's just not, it's not feasible. No. And is it safe? For, do, do patients feel that it's safe for them to take part in surgical trials such as this? Yeah, oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think we can reassure patients quite strongly that being in a trial is quite a safe place to be. Um, mm. And indeed, there's lots of evidence to say that patients who take part in trials uh, get better care and have better outcomes than patients who don't take part in trials. Lots of reasons why that might be the case. There's something called the healthy volunteer effect in which uh, healthier patients uh, patients who are good at taking pills and perhaps have better lifestyles than um, those who don't want to take part in trials um, um, just do better, and that's for obvious reasons. Um, but also sometimes, and this might sound a bit strange to the audience, um, surgeons who take part in trials and stentors who take part in trials are some are, tend to be the higher performing professionals, uh, and, and also they are really, really keen to try to prove, in inverted commas, that their technique is better than stenting or stenting is better than surgery. So perhaps 
there are intangible um, modifications or you know, the X factor uh, that people bring to the table to, 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 to really try to make sure that the procedures that are done in trials are done as well as possible. And that, that's not to say that surgeons at centers don't try the best every day. But sometimes you just push that little bit harder when you know you're yeah. taking part in a trial and when you know your results are going to be uh, observed and therefore critiqued uh, by the international surgical and stenting communities. True. Okay. And um, one of the other questions that occurred to me is sort of what's next? What 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 might be the wider implications of of the outcomes of this trial ac across healthcare? Yeah. As I said in the talk, um, carotid uh, interventions are the commonest uh, peripheral vascular procedure done worldwide. Um, mm. Maybe up to half a million are done worldwide. Um, and before the results of ACST2, it was really very unclear as to whether surgery was better than stenting or stenting was better than surgery. And now I think we can pretty reliably conclude that both procedures, if done competently, have equivalent long-term protection against stroke. Obviously, it'd be nice to see what the 10-year results of ACST2 are, because often when you compare invasive surgery with minimally invasive stents, uh, stenting is superficially attractive in the short term, but the long-term durability falls down with prolonged observation. So that's why it's really important to carry on following ACST two patients up for a further five years and plans are in place to do that. But I think what we now know is that um, you can have uh, an open and honest and uh, unbiased conversation um, with patients who require clotted intervention. Mm. Uh, and you can choose the uh, procedure, stenting or surgery, that appears most attractive to the patient. And that takes in to uh, uh, account patient factors, patient preference, anatomical um, factors, because some arteries aren't suited to stenting and some necks aren't suitable for, for operating. Um, and, and, and you can choose what's best for the individual patient. Um, so we now have evidence-based practice, whereas before perhaps it was prejudice-based practice. Okay, I think one last question that I've just seen is, um, did you look at people who had had uh, TIAs or was it only um, uh, patients who had had a full stroke? Yeah, um, that's a good question. The, the trial was for asymptomatic carotid patients and we defined that as patients who had no recent symptoms upstream from their narrow neck artery. Um, but around one third of patients in ACST2 um, had had prior um, TIAs or prior minor strokes, sometimes af affecting the other side of the brain so a contralateral um, uh, brain attack, um, but, but, but sometimes on the same side of the artery that we're operating on, but several months down the line, from, and they made a, a good recovery. Um, but before you do one of these neck artery procedures, you need to be pretty certain that the patient's going to live for five plus years, because if yeah. they don't live that long, all you're doing is exposing them to immediate hazard of your operation, and they don't have any capacity to benefit long term. So the, 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 the patient's had to be really quite high performance before they were uh, allowed into ACST2. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the direct, direct answer to your question is around a third of patients had had prior brain symptoms, not always on the same side as the clotted lesion though. Okay, we have a, thank you for that, Richard. Thank you. We have a question from Aisha, um, who says the um, very interesting uh, reporting the procedural versus non-procedural outcomes side by side and showed how the curves don't cross each other when non-procedural. Is this routine and how all procedural trials report outcomes? Um, it's not routine. It probably should be um, because it's very, very important to separate hazard from long term benefit. Um, and there's a boring statistical reason why it's the right thing to do, because those graphs, the live table plots, depend on, on, on constant proportional hazard. So the risks need to be fairly stable over time. And you can't get much more um, um, uh, unconstant, if that's a word than short-term hazard flipping to long-term benefit. Um, so, so that's the, the short-term reason. That's the statistical reason. I mean, the, the more practical reason is the procedural hazards we see in trials are, are probably quite peculiar to the trial context. Um, patients and surgeons who take part in trials are a small subset of the overall population of surgeons and patients. And, and for that reason, the procedural risks we see in trials don't generalize outside of trials at the time, time the trials are being run. And they certainly don't generalize to future years. Trials are funny. 
in, in a randomized trial, we take patients from yesterday and we seek to apply the lessons learned to patients of tomorrow. Um, that, that translation, the generalizability on proportional reductions or proportional effects is generalizable to future generations of carotid patients. Um, but the procedural hazards are not generalizable. And I think if you want to know what procedural risks are in 2022, you need to go to a large registry, and there are lots of those around, with tens or hundreds of thousands of carotid procedures. Uh, and that's how you know the contemporary procedural risks um, of carotid interventions today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we're we're just one minute over, so that was really interesting and very informative. Thank you, Richard. And I don't see any more questions in the chat. Just to let participants know that we will be sharing this uh, presentation on our YouTube channel and uh, across social media platforms. So if you did want to listen again and share with uh, colleagues, please feel free. But now I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Richard, for your time today. Thank you, Sarah. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Richard. That was great. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks that was really good. Thanks. Great. That's a, a tick in the box for outreach. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. See you. Bye. Bye, Bye now. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.